Uh, you guys, I have so enjoyed your staff over the past eight months as I've had the chance to interact with them and uh, come out on several occasions and then we do Zoom calls uh, to debrief things and uh, I've just, uh, Bethel Church has a very special place in my heart as I've had the chance to, to get to know them and invest in them and now I get to meet you. And so I've been very excited about that. I do a lot of work with a lot of churches, but rarely uh, do I get to actually meet with the, uh, the leaders of that church. So this is just a, a real joy. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about two things. I'm going to be uh, talking to you twice. One, I'm going to talk to you about how did Jesus, how does Jesus define leader and how do you develop leaders? That's the two things I'm going to focus on today. I was speaking in Chicago several years ago uh, to a group just like this. And prior to me getting up, they had, you know, things going on just like you did. And they had three different volunteer leaders stand up and give a testimony before I got up to speak. Each one stood up, took two to three minutes and, and said whatever they were going to say. But all three said something fascinated me, said something of this nature. Well, hey, you know, I'm not much of a leader. And then they went on. And then the next one. Well, you know, I don't consider myself a leader. And the next one, well, I'm not much of a leader. I wouldn't call me a leader. But yet they were leading in children's ministry and men's ministry and the different ministries. But all three said that. And I found it fascinating. I couldn't help myself. When I got up on stage, I had to address it. And I was like, hey, you guys, man, thank you for leading in this church. Thank you for your humility. I, I so value that that, that, that you come from a humble place and a, a humble spirit. And I love that. But you know, guys, sometimes as Christ followers and leaders, we can find ourselves saying that phrase, well, I'm not a leader. I'll help out in the church, but I'm not a leader. And sometimes we're not saying it from a place of humility. We're saying it from a place of insecurity. You can't lead from a place of insecurity and a place of dependence on Christ at the same time. Yes, we have to be humble as leaders. But if you are stepping into leadership with a spirit of insecurity, you can't remain dependent on Christ at the same time. Two cannot coexist. And for so many Christian leaders, they're seeking self-confidence versus God-confidence in what they're trying to accomplish with the children, the students, the adults that they're leading, that they're working with. And here's what I've discovered. When you lead from a place of insecurity, you are trying to find, you are trying to find or prove your identity. And Jesus never gave us a position of leadership to find or prove our identity. He wants our identity anchored in him. And so I was asking myself the question after I left there, why? Why did these, these leaders with a humble spirit, but why did they say that? Why do so many Christian leaders in the church say, oh, I'm not a leader, don't call me, why? Why? I think it's because they define leadership based on cultural, uh, on, uh, uh, cultural principles, not biblical principles. We define leadership culturally, not spiritually, not biblically. We look, at, we look around to try to find a leader and we're looking for business acumen. We're looking for vision. We're looking for decisiveness. We're looking for strategic thinkers. Nothing wrong with that. But... We've got to be careful and not just define leader based on the culture around us. Um, everywhere I go, I, I meet with different churches and pastors. And here's, here's something I'm discovering that uh, same thing that Lifeway Research found out. That Lifeway Research last year surveyed a bunch of pastors and they said, what is your biggest anxiety? Tell us your biggest anxiety. And, and they gave them things like friends and fellowship, consistency and personal prayer, uh, people's apathy, lack of commitment, fostering connection with unchurched people. But the number one challenge, anxiety, that pastors self-identified is leadership development in their church. 
I see it everywhere I go. Churches are struggling, developing leaders and, and, and identifying leaders and getting people to step into leadership. They don't want to step into leadership in the church. And I just have to ask myself the question, is it because people are defining leadership based on culture, not scripture? Uh, YouGov is a, 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 an organization that does polling and they ask 42,000 people uh, across the world, who are the most admired male leaders in, uh, in, in your life? Who are the males that you admire the most? And here's what they came up with. Here's what the poll showed. You got Barack Obama, Bill Gates is number one and number two. Now, when you look at the, the list, and they, they had a list of top 20, when you look at the list, there's politics, there's power, there's wealth, there's prestige, there's popularity. And if we're not careful, we can define leader based on culture, not scripture. And so when you look at these admired icons that, that the world looks at and sets up as icons as, as of leaders, then how does, yes, it's going to impact the way we think and the way we define leader. But here's the thing. When we define leader culturally, not biblically, it leads to one of two things. It leads to, hey, I'm not that or I want that. Both extremes are dangerous. Ooh, culturally, that's what I want to be as a leader. That's dangerous. Or I'm not that. That's equally as dangerous. Jacob Morgan did, a, uh, he, he did a, some research and he asked 140 CEOs across the world to define leader. What is a leader? And he, he said, would you write a definition and submit it to me? And so they did. And when he got the results back, when he got all 140 back, he discovered that not one of them gave the same definition. Every one of them was different. So it sort of leads us to the, to the question, how do you define leader? How do you define leader? Now, this is really important because if you don't define it, you don't know what you're looking for. You don't know what you're shaping, creating when you're, when you're developing a leader. There is a, uh, a rule in aviation called the one in 60 rule. And what the one in 60 rule says, it says for every one degree, a plane it veers off its course, it misses its target destination by one mile for every 60 miles you fly. Now that's fascinating to me. Just one degree off, 60 miles later, you're, you're, you're off track and you keep staying, veer off track for a long period of time, you're way off track. And I just wonder, has the church begin to veer off track in defining what a leader is? Do we really understand what Jesus is talking about when he talks about a leader? Listen, a Christian leader should be distinct. We should stand out. There should be a courage about us and a humility about us at the same time. What was it, Acts 4, that the, the, the religious leaders looked at, 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 uh, at the disciples and took note of their courage and took note that these men had been with Jesus. When we spend time with Jesus, it should transform something in our spirit that makes us distinct as leaders, that makes us have a boldness, a courage, that we should stand out, we should be memorable, leave an impression, have an influence. That's the type of Christ follower leaders that Jesus wants to build. And I think there are four consequences we can experience when we don't define leader, uh, when, when our definition of leader veers off. The first consequence is we recruit people based on external traits. We look around and go, okay, who has vision? Who has business acumen? And we just pick the most obvious leaders rather than looking at character and competency. We just look at competency. We gotta be, we gotta be careful with that. When Jesus selected his 12, he didn't choose the most educated, theologically educated people of his day. No, he chose a bunch of fishermen. The second consequence is we train people in leadership behaviors that are substandard for a kingdom leader. If we misdefine leader, then we won't train them towards leadership. 
Here's, here's what I, I tell churches all the time. Churches look around and they look for somebody to lead, small groups, children, uh, youth ministry, guest services, whatever. They look for a leader and they go, okay, there's somebody. And, and then they, if they do any train, training, which most don't do any training at all, but if they do, here's what they do. Here's our policies and procedures manual. Here's where the supplies are. Here's what time you need to be here. Here's your responsibilities. And leadership development gets limited to turning a ministry widget in the church versus teaching people to live a biblical lifestyle of leadership. You see, many people look at what I do, leadership development, and go, stop trying to bring the corporate world into the church. I'm not. I'm talking about discipleship. And the reason the church is so anemic in our country today is we have taught people to live like Jesus, but we never disciple them to lead like Jesus. And there's a big difference. And so we end up with great people with great character, but they don't know how to lead. Jesus taught his disciples to have the character of Christ, but he taught them to be bold, world-changing leaders at the same time. It's not an, you guys, the church, it's my conviction, the church should be raising up the best leaders on the planet. We have the best book ever written in the history of mankind. We have the best model that ever walked the planet Earth. And besides those two things, we have the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Why in the world is the church not discipling leaders that are transforming the community and transforming the world? It doesn't make sense to me unless we've just misdefined what leader is. And everywhere I go, I see it. Hey, would you be a leader in our children's ministry? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It it won't take you much. And we begin to lower the bar of leadership and begin to lower it and lower it. Oh, you know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Jesus, there were, there were three men. I think it's in Luke chapter nine. Jesus called a couple of them and a couple of them volunteered. And he's like, hey, 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 if you want to follow me as a leader, I, the bar's right here. He never lowered the bar. And I'm afraid we define leader based on culture and we begin to lower the bar and the church should be raising up the best leaders on the planet. Now, the third consequence, I'll hit these next couple quick because I want to show you something. We struggle to get maturing believers to step into leadership. We struggle to get maturing believers to step into leadership when we misdefine leadership because maturing believers begin to, who, who, are, who are beginning to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, and they begin, there's a tug on their heart to do something significant. And then the church recruits them to be a task manager versus a difference maker. And so they go, Tom Schultz began to do a study years ago, several years ago, called The Rise of the Duns, D-O-N-E-S. And it's people who've been going to church for years, and, and, and then all of a sudden they're just like, you know what? I'm just done with church. I've, 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 I've been in the small groups, and I've served in an usher, and I've been a greeter, and I've done this, and, I've, and I'm, just, I'm just done. I'm not being challenged. I'm not finding any significant meaning in my life and my leadership. I'm just done and they're stepping away from the church. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's a reality. That the maturing believers go, there's gotta be more. Here's what I've discovered. If you are following Jesus and you are listening to Jesus, he's always raising the bar on you. 59 years old. I'm thinking, I moved to Charleston, I'm around my grandbabies, I'm around my kids, I'm gonna cruise the rest of my life. And God says, no, you're not, you're gonna start a company. I'm like, no, no. And so at 61 years old, I'm trying to you know, get this thing and, and, and cause God's like, no, 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 I'm not gonna let you rest. As long as you're listening, he's challenging. And if you're not feeling challenged, you may not be listening. 
Fourth consequence, leaders <laughs> leading without spiritual power. If we misdefine leader, then we have spiritual leaders leading without spiritual power. Oh, I wish I could spend more time on this, but here's the question. What are you expecting God to do? What are you leading right now? Are you leading in preschool ministry? Are, are you leading in children's ministry? Are you leading in guest services? Are you leading a small group? Are you leading a men's group? Are you leading a women's group? What are you looking for God to do? Several years ago, it hit me as my team was together and we were planning for, the, for that next year and setting our goals. I looked at our goals and I said, guys, there's a problem with our goals. And they're like, what's the problem? I said, we can achieve every one of these. We have the power to do it. I want to put, uh, guys, from now on, we're going to start praying dangerous prayers. And when you begin to pray dangerous prayers, it will require, it will require you to make courageous decisions. And I told him, we're going to pray. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to set some higher goals and we'll begin to trust for God. We're going to begin to trust God to do something. What are you trusting God to do in your area of ministry? So that's what happens when we, when we define leader culturally. It's just we veer off, we get off track, and there are consequences to it. Now, listen, but this is so funny to me. Jesus had the same problem. He had the same problem. Um, if, if you look in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, and Luke 22, all right, in those passages, here's what you see. Luke 9, I mean, uh, Mark 9, the 12 are arguing about who is the greatest. <laughs> Jesus, they're walking down the road and Jesus said, hey, what, what are y'all talking about? And he said, well, you know, who's, who's, who's the greatest? And, uh, and, and so then in Mark uh, uh, 10, then all of a sudden, uh, James and John are saying, hey, can we sit at your left and right? Can we have the position of power? And then later on, Luke 22, they're arguing again. He's like, what are you arguing about? Well, we're arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> and so yeah, three times, three times these guys are arguing. There's a power grab because they're misdefining leadership. Now, it's interesting to me when you look at Luke chapter 9, when you look at one of these episodes and you look at what Jesus said in this particular, I uh, can't get that to transition, it's stuck on me. Can you guys advance that? Here we go. Uh, in in uh, Luke chapter 9, it says, an argument started among them and the disciples, uh, which would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. So he's going to illustrate for them what true leadership is. Now, here's what's interesting. An argument started among them and Jesus, it doesn't say Jesus hearing their words. It says, Jesus knowing their thoughts. Jesus heard their words, but he saw what was beneath the surface of their words. So it says, uh, knowing their thoughts. And so the Greek word there, it means to, to, uh, to uh, the, the word argue and, and thoughts, knowing their thoughts, both of those words are the same. So hey, hearing them argue, same Greek word as knowing their thoughts. And the word means an inward reasoning or opinion. An inward reasoning or opinion. In other words, Jesus is going, I see your hearts. I see what's in your hearts. You're arguing because you think your reasoning is that you're better than each other. That you're gonna be at the top, that you're gonna be the leader of this whole thing. Now, this is because undoubtedly because of their cultural influence. If you look at the cultural influence of these young men, one of the people, if you'd done a, if you had, if YouGov would have existed back then and they did a survey of the most admired men in the world, one of them would have been Herod, Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas, fascinating guy. Uh, first, he was the son of Herod the Great. Caesar Augustus said of Herod the Great, he said, it is better to be one of Herod's pigs than it is to be one of his sons because he killed his own sons for disloyalty, some of his own sons for, because of their disloyalty. <laughs> this, is, this is a mean guy. That's who Herod Antipas was raised by. Secondly, 
He reigned the er, in, the, in the area of Galilee and Perea from 4 BC to 37 AD. Now, this is the time period when these young disciples who were anywhere from 15 to 18, 20 years old when they started following Jesus, they were born under his reign. Most of them were born and raised in the Galilee area. And so they would have, they would have uh, 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 grown up under his influence. Now he ruled in this area in the green, in Galilee, Perea, and that's exactly where they lived in that time. So they would have been very much influenced by him. If you look at this, this is, this is where Herod Antipas' palace was first located. It was located here on the top of this mountain, and it's said that that's where he put John the Baptist when he imprisoned John the Baptist. But look at the power that that, could you imagine a palace on top of this place? This guy had great power. And then he, he moved his capital from, from that location to Tiberias along the sea. And here uh, uh, he, he built this beautiful, luxurious palace. Now, here's what's fascinating is when he moved here, these guys would have been young. And this was a 15 miles from where these guys lived just 15 miles. And so now his influence will be even greater because now he's even closer to these guys. They would be very familiar with how this guy operated. And then we also know that Herod Antipas is the one that while these guys were serving Jesus, beheaded John the Baptist. That's their cultural influence. We can understand why these guys define, these young disciples define leader the way they did. Now I wanna show you something. Here's what's fascinating. Uh, several years ago, I put the, I'm, and we're going to talk more about this in the next session. But several years ago, I was studying through the life of Christ and I put his life together chronologically. And I put it in this framework of uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. So here's what I want you to notice. And uh, this blows so many people away when they see this. If you look right here at the fall of 26 AD, that's where Jesus uh, uh, took his ministry public his baptism, his temptation. At his baptism or after his baptism and temptation, he met some of what would become his apostles, okay? He met Peter, he met Andrew, uh, James, uh, probably John, Nathaniel, and Philip. So six of what would be his apostles he met at this point. Now I want you to jump over to the fall of 27 AD. That's where he looked at Peter, James, Andrew, and John and said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. One year after public, he went public with his ministry. Most people think Jesus was baptized. He did, went through his temptation. He recruited 12 guys and they spent three years with him. That's not how it went down. They met him a year earlier. And then a year later, he said, come follow me, but not as leaders, not as leaders but as disciples and followers. And then look, nine months later in the summer of 28 AD, that's when Jesus says, okay, now I'm gonna choose you to be my leaders. And we're gonna look more at that in the next session. But here's what's fascinating. Look at this. When did these guys, not the, the fact that they were arguing who was the greatest, that's one thing. But when did they argue about who was the greatest? It wasn't in the 26 AD, it wasn't in 27, it wasn't even in 28 after they were following Jesus as leaders. It was in 29 AD, in the fall of 29 AD, Jesus predicted his death three times. After the second time he predicted his death, that's when the disciples episode of arguing who would be the greatest. Who would be the greatest? The word is in Greek is mega, means weighty. Who's gonna be the weightiest? Not now, but later. They weren't arguing about who's the greatest right now. They were arguing who's gonna be the greatest later. Then Jesus predict his death a third time. And that's when James and John and their mama went to him and said, hey, can we sit at your left and right? And then in Luke 22, look all the way over in spring of 30 AD, they're sitting at the Last Supper, Jesus' final night with these guys. And they're arguing and he says, what are you arguing about? And they were arguing about which one of them would be the greatest. It's not just the fact that they were wanting to be the greatest, it's when they were wanting to be the greatest. 
reveals something about their definition of leader, the misunderstanding of what a leader is. That fascinates me. So how did Jesus respond? Jesus responded (laughs) over his time. One one thing too, before I move on from this, does this show you how long it takes to develop a leader? Do you see that? Just because... And so often we look at, well, no, I can't, I can't, I can't let you lead. I can't let you lead because I don't know. It's just, you're, you're not ready. Your character's not ready yet. Jesus still sent them out two by two on their own, even when they were desiring to be the greatest, because he recognized that developing somebody's character and competency takes time, takes time. Now, Jesus used three words. He never wrote a definition of leadership development, but he used three words to describe leadership. Never wrote a definition of leadership, but he he, he used three words to describe leader. The first one is slave. In Mark chapter 10, 42 through 44, it says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them as their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. He said, that's not you. You're not the type of guys that have power and authority and lord it over people. If you want to be first, you have to be a slave. And that Greek word, that Greek word means to, to be devoted to, to another with disregard to your own interest. To be devoted to somebody with disregard to your own interest. It's just like, hey, if we're a Christian leader, I'm there to serve you. I'm there to serve you. What does it mean to serve? It means to make you better, to help you grow, to help you achieve your God-given goals. That's what a leader does. It makes... I, uh, sometimes people go, hey, my, 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 yeah, how do I make my leaders better? I gotta, I, gotta make, I, gotta, I gotta get more out of my leaders. I gotta get more out of my leaders. I tell them every single time, if you wanna get more out of your leaders, put more into your leaders. Because if I put more into my leaders, more is gonna come out of them. Stop focusing on getting more out of them. Start focusing on putting more in them. And watch what comes out. So he said, hey, it's, it, a Christian leader is a slave, a servant. Somebody who puts the interest of others first. But secondly, he used another word, and it's disciple. And in John chapter uh, 13, he calls, he calls these guys disciples. What is that word? We're all familiar with that word. It means learner. It means a learner, a student. Leadership is about continually learning from Jesus. Let me ask you, it's what kills me. In the church so often... I hear this from staff members all the time, not here, uh, 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 other places. I, I'm, seriously, <laughs> I've not heard them say this, but, but I do hear it where I go a lot of times. Yeah, we try to get our leaders to participate in leadership development, but they don't want it. They tell us they don't need it. Now, I understand. I understand sometimes the quality of leadership development in churches is not good. And that's what my life's dedicated to changing because people value what adds value to them. And if you're providing good leadership development, guess what? People are gonna participate. And you guys are gonna be a part of making it it good. So, you know, without constant study, leadership lacks direction and depth. Without constant learning, your leadership will lack depth. I I talk to older leaders sometimes who are so experienced in leadership but they stopped growing 10, 15 years ago. And they go, I don't understand why these young people don't listen to me. I got a lot of experience. It's because you stopped growing. You stopped learning. And when you stop learning, you're no longer relevant. You're stuck. Jesus constantly pushed these guys. We'll see it next in the next session. He didn't let them rest. There was never a settling. There was never a stopping. It's always growing. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to grow you? Now, I got to show you this one. There's a third word. He calls them apostles. Now, this word apostle is fascinating to me because 600 years before Christ, the word apostle was used to speak of an admiral of a ship who was sent by a king of a territory to say, hey, go explore and find land that has never been conquered When you find that land, pull up on shore, unpack your boat, unpack your ship, and set up a city 
that's reflective of our culture, the, the culture that I rule and reign in. So that if I ever go there, I will feel comfortable. Isn't that cool? Culture shaper. That's what, a, that's what an apostle was. The word's also used to speak of a representative, an ambassador. You can speak on behalf of uh, that individual with full authority, but it was also used to speak of a military leader, a military leader who would go into a land, and uh, boy, Israel was familiar with this, a military leader who would go into a land that was freshly conquered, and they would, this military leader would show up with linguists and architects and musicians and poets and, and just establish, turn that enemy territory into a culture that's reflective of that of the king. You guys, are you putting this together? You see what a Christian leader is? We're somebody who, we're somebody who, who, who shapes the culture. When you're leading and you're, you're stepping into that preschool room, you're stepping into that children's elementary small group, you're stepping in to shape a kingdom culture, to shape in the hearts, minds, soul, personality, and character of the people that you are leading. You're stepping into it to bring the kingdom of God into their soul. This is significant, not easy, because there's an enemy culture that's fighting against it. And so I begin to wrestle and say, okay, if this is how Jesus describes a leader, then what's, what's the, <laughs> these three overlapping factors, then what's the definition of leader? And so here's, here's what I put down. A leader is one who is continually growing in the likeness of Christ. That's a disciple. Guided by the Holy Spirit to skillfully provide care, direction, accountability, and development of a group or team of people. Uniting, that's the apostle, uniting them to humbly serve the church, community, and world. Imagine, imagine what would happen if people begin to define leader this way instead of culturally. I planted a church in 1997. I selected seven key leaders that I put over our seven ministries. And I said, guys, I'm going to lead through you. I need you to lead your area of ministry. One year into it, I was frustrated. Uh, I loved them, but I was frustrated because I thought they're, they're, they're not doing what I want them to do. They're, 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 they're looking to me for everything. They're looking to me for answers. They're asking me questions on this, that, and, 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 and they're not acting empowered and they're, 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 they're not taking leadership the way a disciple would. And so I, I said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define leader for you. And so uh, I, I'm going to give you a description uh, of leader. And so this is, this is what I gave him. I sat down and did a training with him. And I said, guys, here's what, I, here's what I'm looking for you to do as a Christ, a Christ follower leader. I, I want you to do leadership development. I want you to disciple the leaders underneath you. I want you to empower others. I don't want you doing everything. I want you empowering others. I want to I see you affirming, encouraging, drawing out the strengths and gifts of those around you. That's what a humble servant does. Uh, I want to see you providing direction. The only way you can provide direction is go before the father on your knees and say, God, what do you want to do in this team? And show me. And then boom, you, you can provide direction. Evaluation. How do we make it better? How do we make it better? Sometimes we just put it on cruise control. We put our ministry on cruise control and we just let it run. Guys, we got to be making it better. Recruit others. We've got to always be recruiting others, and then you've got to provide soul care for your team. And so I laid that out for him and said, guys, you, something's got to change. Because we're not, we're not seeing God work if you're just showing up and just doing the minimum. I, I, want, to see you, I want to see you act this way. And man, it was game changer. It was a game changer when my leaders began to understand they had empowerment and they had authority. We'll look at this later, but when Jesus selected the 12 as leaders, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to heal the sick. 
if you've said yes to Jesus in leadership, he's saying, I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you power. Go act like a spiritual leader and shape the culture, the kingdom culture in your sphere of influence wherever you're leading and watch God work.